Grace and peace be unto all of you, certainly from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good evening, First Baptist Church, Denby. This is the Reverend Ryan Perkins. Welcome each and every one of you to Wednesday night Bible study. We certainly thank God for this marvelous opportunity that he has given to us one more time uh, to gather together, not only uh, individually and yet collectively around the truth of the word of God. And we trust that every one of you has had a wonderful day in the Lord. We thank God that you have taken time out of your busy schedules uh, to tune in to Wednesday night Bible study coming to you by way of Facebook Live on the church's Facebook page. And we're certainly excited and delighted tonight to continue our study uh, coming from uh, the Epistle to the Church at Colossae. And of course, that was written by the Apostle Paul underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we're excited tonight to dive into the text uh, this evening. As always, we certainly want to uh, thank God for uh, our uh, friends uh, and these leaders here uh, on uh, the intercessory prayer team. I've always said uh, and I've always encouraged uh, you all and myself as well that we're going to be everything that God intends us to be, uh, then we're going to have to be men and women of consistent and vibrant prayer. And these folk on the intercessory team prayer are providing for us what a, a wonderful example of going to the Lord in prayer on a consistent basis, not only uh, on behalf of our church and our families, uh, but also certainly our state, our nation, and indeed the world. And you all know that these are definitely praying times. We thank God for them. We thank God for their leadership. We certainly thank God for their faithfulness. Because again, uh, we've got to be prayer prayers that are consistent. Uh, not uh, praying only when uh, things are, are, are difficult or things are tough, but we're praying consistently. But the Bible tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. So again, we thank God uh, for each and every one of them. So we thank God again for each and every one of you that are joining in uh, tonight. And again, we thank God that you took it uh, in your heart and in your mind and counted not robbery again to take time out of your busy schedule uh, to tune in to Wednesday night Bible study. We certainly want to thank uh, Deacon Roy Carswell, uh, and the technology ministry uh, that stood in the gap where I was out for a couple of weeks. And we certainly thank God for them. Uh, I know you all were in good hands, but I'm certainly delighted to be back before uh, my wonderful uh, church family here at First Baptist Church, Denby. Not only are we are to be men and women of prayer, but we also are to be men and women of the word of God. This is why Bible study, not only on Wednesday night, the Sunday morning worship service, but even daily time, precious time that we need to take in the word of God, again, on a daily basis, feasting upon the word of God, building ourselves up, the Bible says, on a daily basis as we continue to work out our soul salvation in fear and trembling, as we continue to deal with sin in our life, as we're pressing forward, as Paul said, toward that high calling in Christ Jesus, which is Christ's likeness. That we are, uh, through the power of the Spirit, uh, conforming ourselves, as it were, to the very image of Christ that has been revealed to us in the precious Word of God. So tonight, saints, again, we're going to continue our study uh, coming from the book of Colossians. And tonight we're going to be dealing with um, chapter number one. And I'm going to take us through, God willing, tonight, verses three through eight. So if you have your Bibles... Uh, turn, if you will, to the book of Colossians, chapter number one, and I'm going to read in your hearing uh, verses uh, three through eight, coming from the King James Version of the Bible. And again, we certainly thank God and delight to see uh, folks joining in uh, even now. The book of Colossians, chapter number one, and again, I'll be reading your hearing tonight, verses three through eight coming from the King James Version of the Bible. The word of the Lord declares, we give thanks to God 
and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bring it forth fruit, as doth it also in you, since the day that ye heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye learned of Epaphroditus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful, faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love, watch this now, saints, in the spirit uh, that is in and through the very spirit of God that lives on the inside of each and every believer. This is the word of God for God's people. And may we bow in prayer to open up our time together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now to say thank you. We are grateful and thankful tonight uh, to be back uh, at Wednesday night Bible study here at First Baptist Church. Denby, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for your mercy, your loving kindness that has been extended to each and every one of us, Father God, uh, beginning by waking us up this morning, extended, Father God, all throughout the day, protecting us, protecting our families, our loved ones from all forms of hurt, harm, and danger, danger seen and unseen, danger known and unknown. You wrapped a mighty shield of protection around us. And for that, Father God, we want to say thank you. We thank you, Father God, for this marvelous opportunity that we have as a church family to gather around your precious word. And to that end, Father God, as always, we are praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to rest, rule, and abide in every heart and, Father God, in every life. We're counting on you tonight, Father God, to open up our understanding, to provide, Father God, for us teaching, learning, and application power that we may be able, Father God, through the power of the Spirit to apply these things that we're going to be learning tonight to our everyday lives as we go through this process of sanctification, becoming more and more like, your Lord, like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his great sacrifice over 2,000 years ago, suffered, bled, and died on a cross, Father God, at Calvary where he paid, Father God, the ultimate price for our sins. He was buried, but he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures with power and authority in his hand. And we thank you, Father God, when we place saving faith in him. Our names are written in the Lamb Book of Life. We have the right to the tree of life. And for that, Father God, we say thank you. Have your way tonight. Be magnified, Father God, in and through us tonight. And we'll be careful, Father God, to give you the glory, the and all the honor because it rightfully, God, belongs to you. We love you on the day because you first loved us. We ask all these things in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's children say amen and amen. Colossians chapter number one. And for context purposes, we're just going to start in verse number one and deal with Paul's uh, greeting and salutation leading up into verse number three. Uh, in verse number one, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It was the same uh, apostle Paul that when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he said uh, in the second chapter that God saved us for a purpose. Well, Paul said he uh, saved us that we will walk in good works, which were preordained established by God in his sovereignty and in his power and also in his grace. Paul says that we would walk in them, live in them, do that which God has called us to do. And one of the things that, that God had called the apostle Paul to do is to be a sent one, the apostle of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it was by the sovereign will of God that God made him apostle and that God worked in and through him to use him mightily, uh, even so much that you and I today are benefiting from how God utilized the Apostle Paul in writing uh, this holy written, writing 
this text of scripture. And Paul says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And he's with Timothy, our brother. Of course, you all know that Timothy is Paul's son in the faith, which means that Timothy came to saving faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in and through the ministry of the apostle Paul. And certainly God not only used the apostle Paul, but you know Timothy's story. He also utilized Timothy's mother and grandmother, who Paul tells us in his second letter to Timothy, exposed him uh, from a very early age. Paul says the holy scriptures, the sacred writings, which are able to make us wise unto salvation. And Paul and, and Timothy is a co-laborer. You're going to hear that, that phrase again later on tonight. He is a co-laborer with the apostle Paul in the work. Uh, that God has called each of them to do. So Timothy, uh, Paul says that Timothy is right here with me. And he, and then he tells us who he's writing this letter to. The Bible says, uh, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Saints and faithful brethren in Christ. The word saint means that we are the beloved of God. And certainly God demonstrated his love and that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Every believer is termed a saint in the word of God. And then he says, faithful brethren. Say, so this is what uh, God is looking for in each and every one of us. He's looking for us to be faithful. He's looking for us to be consistent and to have a great deal of fidelity. It simply means faithfulness uh, to the things of God faithful to the study of scripture, faithful to prayer on a consistent basis, faithful in gathering together on the first day of the week that we may worship God uh, corporately. That we may hear a message from the pulpit that will build us up, that will exhort us, encourage us, even reprove and rebuke us to go out of the four walls of the church to do the work of the ministry. God is looking for faithful folk. He's looking for faithful folk to execute the gifting that he has give them, given them within the body of Christ for his glory and for the benefit of the body of Christ. God, saints, is looking for us to be faithful. He is not looking for us to be sometimey Christians. He's not looking for us to be situational Christians. Uh, he's not looking for us to, ha to be have it your way Christians. But he wants us to be faithful in that which he has commanded us to do, faithful in that which he has called us to do. And Paul says, I'm writing this letter uh, to the beloved, the saints and the faithful brethren, which are what which are in Christ. Now, that phrase in Christ talks about their salvation and, and our salvation experience. Uh, we are in Christ. And as a consequence, Christ is what is in us. Uh, in and through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this is who Paul is writing to, this church in Colossae, which I believe at this time, many biblical historians uh, agree with this, that at the time that Paul is writing uh, uh, this uh, inspired text, uh, the, the, the church at Colossae had never laid eyes on the apostle Paul. But yet God, in his wisdom, in his love, and in his sovereignty, in his providential work, uh, inspire Paul to write this text to them and to us today, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Then Paul says, grace be unto you and peace from God, our father and our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. Both grace and peace are byproducts of our wonderful salvation. First of all, it was grace as you well know, that saved us. It was the unmerited favor of God. God looked beyond our uh, great faults and saw our even greater need to be saved, to be delivered, to be rescued from the penalty and power of our sin, to be connected back to him in and through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, he picked us up. He turned us around he planted our feet on the solid ground of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all that was all that was done, saints, by his grace, his unmerited favor. 
You don't deserve salvation. Certainly, I don't deserve salvation. That's why we are saved by the grace of God. And when you and I are saved by the grace of God, he gives us his peace. And peace here, uh, really, uh, the main focus of this peace here uh, is reconciliation. We'll deal with that later on uh, during our time together. It's reconciliation because uh, prior to Jesus Christ being the go between, the, the bridge between God and man, we were alienated from God because our sin. God is holy. He's perfect uh, in all his ways, cannot and will not tolerate sin. So in order for us to be reconciled to God, in order for us to have relationship with him, by which we can call out to him in prayer, Abba, Father, he is our father. Oh, we had to go in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he gives us peace <laughs> that the Bible describes that is going to surpass all natural understanding. Now, these two things, grace and peace, are byproducts of our wonderful salvation which is found in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice what Paul says in verse number three of the text. Uh, Paul says here, we give thanks to God, our Father, uh, the, uh, uh, God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The we here, of course, is Paul, Timothy, and I would argue also the other co-laborers that are with Paul uh, in the ministry supporting Paul. Uh, in the ministry, uh, they are giving thanks to God, uh, not only God the Father, but the Son as well. He's giving thanks to God for them. Remember now, the Bible tells us as believers uh, that we are to give thanks in everything. In everything, the Bible says give thanks. Whether you and I are in a mountaintop experience, or whether we find ourselves in the valley low, you and I are to be men and women of thanksgiving. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Paul writes concerning you and concerning me. Paul says we give thanks to God uh, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And here it is, saints. He says, praying always for you. As we always say, uh, at the beginning of our time together, we and you and I have got to be men and women of prayer. But understand here, Paul is writing uh, under the apostolic authority that God has given to him. He's already identified himself as an apostle of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this here, saints, is a model, it's a paradigm by which church leadership should follow. Not only should the membership be men and women of prayer, but how much more should the leadership, listen very carefully, saints, the leadership should be men and women of prayer. If you are a ministry leader, you ought to be praying for those that are within your ministry and not only praying for them, but praying for the target of your ministry whether it's outreach, whether it's the men's ministry, the women's ministry, whatever it may be, couples, whatever it may be, you're praying not only for your committee members, but you're praying for your target audience as well. If you are a Sunday school teacher, if you're a Wednesday night Bible school teacher, whether it's noonday or uh, uh, evening uh, Bible study, if you are a new members teacher, whatever teaching capacity that you find yourself in, you ought to be praying consistently uh, for uh, your students. Paul says praying always. If you are a tribal leader, part of the diocletic ministry, you ought to be praying for those members that are in your tribe. You ought to be praying for them consistently. Paul says praying always. Ministers of the gospel, pastors of churches, we ought to be praying always consistently for the body of Christ. We are to be men and women of prayer. Paul says, I'm praying for you always. I'm giving God thanks for you always. And this is what we should do. Uh, it's just like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ, you know, was a man of prayer and he was perfect in all his ways. Went about the Bible says doing good, knew no sin. And yet, and still, he was a man of prayer. 
praying for the disciples, even some 2,000 years ago, praying for you and for, and for me. So we ought to be men and women of prayer, praying one for another. And again, I'm going to harp on the diction here. He says, always. This is prayer that, that institutes fidelity, consistency. We're faithful, right, in our prayers. We don't pray simply when we feel like praying. No, we pray consistently whether we feel like praying or not. We're offering up prayers to God. For God's people. Paul says, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for you always. And notice what Paul says here in verse number four, saints. He says, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ. Again, at this particular point in time, uh, Paul uh, had not visited the church in Colossae. They had never laid their natural eyes on Paul. But Paul had been getting reports uh, concerning this wonderful church in Colossae, this Colossian church. And Paul says, since he heard of their faith in Jesus Christ. The word faith here, saints, primarily is referring to saving faith. Uh, Paul here is talking about the faith that was gifted to them by God himself. They place that saving faith on the person and the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They believed in him. As a consequence, they were saved from the penalty of the power of the sin. Names written in the land's book of life. And they are now a part of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, of the called out ones. Paul says, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ. And here it is, saints. One of the tall tale signs, and we've said this many, many times before. We've made this point several times as we work through the trilogy of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, one of the attributes, the tall tale signs uh, of uh, those who have generally placed saving faith in the person and the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that we're going to have love one for another. So Paul says, I've heard about your saving faith that you place in the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he says, and the love, agape, the love of God. This is a self-sacrificing love. This is a love that you choose to, to, to execute uh, in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, irregardless uh, of how the person receives it, irregardless of how the person uh, treats you. This is a determined, uh, a love that is built on determination. I'm determined to love you irregardless of how you treat me. You see, the world loves that lo loves uh, uh, the way uh, in which we um, describe. If you love me, I'm gonna love you, right? I love you because you agree with me. Uh, no, no, no. That that's a base kind of love. That's what we call phileo. It's the love of the world. Here, Paul was referring to the love of God that should be worked out and is worked out in true believers in the life of true believers. And again, it is irregardless of the recipient of love. And again, God demonstrated this love. Listen very carefully, saints. He demonstrated this type of love toward you and I. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, God is holy. He hates sin. But while you and I were in our sin, God commended, demonstrated, manifest, proved his love in that while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. Those of us who have a relationship with God, uh, uh, with God in and through Jesus Christ, you're going to be loving on folk. You're not only going to be loving on the world, your enemies, but you're also going to have love for the brethren, love for the brethren. He, he says here, he says, uh, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love, huh, which ye have what for all the saints. <laughs> See, listen now, saints, we don't have the right to pick and choose who we're going to love. God, in his grace, loves everyone. You understand that? God didn't, just, God didn't say, well, I'm only going to give Christians air to breathe. Uh, I'm only going to give Christians uh, the ability uh, to go out and make a living for their families. I'm only going to keep the hearts beating uh, of Christians. No, he does that 
uh, for the vilest sinner as much as he does for the most devout, uh, the most devout saint. And this is a love that you and I should have. The Bible says for all the saints. Here, Paul is talking about. We're going we're to cross references. Paul is talking about love one for another. We've said this many, many times before. Christ tells us that we're to love one another just as he has loved us. And this should be demonstrated, saints, consistently in the body of Christ. You and I should not be fighting amongst one another. We should not be backbiting one another. We should not be talking down one another. Uh, assassinating folk character by way of gossip and, and, and innuendo. We ought to be forgiving one another when you and, when uh, the person sins against us. We're not to hold grudges. The Bible tells us that we're not to let the sun go down on our wrath. We're to love one another. This should be evident within the body of Christ. Now to underscore this point, this same Apostle Paul because it's, he, he's, uh, uh, the same spirit, the Holy Spirit is working in and through him, made this point to the church at Galatia, the churches in the region of Galatia. So I want us to turn to a very, very familiar passage of scripture, but it's very salient to what Paul is saying here. Remember the sequence by which Paul is writing. He first of all talks about their conversion, their regeneration, the fact that they were born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a byproduct of that transformation. Old things again have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Christian folk are going to love people. They're especially going to love those within the what? The household of faith. And saints, to be honest with you, we have work to do in that area. We're talking about now the universal church. We have work to do in that area. But let's go over to uh, Galatians uh, chapter number six. Yeah, it, it's Galatians chapter number six. And when you find Galatians chapter number six, let's begin in verse number nine. Galatians chapter six. Yes, beginning in verse number nine. Notice what Paul says here now. First of all, he says in verse number nine, and let us, he's talking here to believers, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't allow ourselves uh, to get tired <laughs> huh, of doing what is right. Now, this can happen when our motivation for doing right is, is not the right motivation. Our ultimate motivation for doing well, doing what is right, loving on folk, forgiving people, right, uh, it, it is not necessarily the primary goal is not necessarily for their benefit. It's to glorify God. It's to demonstrate, first of all, our what our love for him. You understand that? Because, again, saints, if our motivation is a response. Huh? Uh, from someone by which the is the object of our love, they may not respond the way we would like for them to respond. They may not respond the way that we think they uh, uh, should respond. And when we have that motivation, we can get weary in well-doing. So I'm tired of uh, uh, loving on sister so-and-so. I'm tired of a brother so-and-so not reciprocating my love to him uh, in a way that he should reciprocate that back to me. Well, we have the wrong motivation. Our motivation should be to please, to love, and to glorify God. So if that's our motivation, irregardless of how that person responds, we're not going to be weary in well-doing. Our motivation, saints, first and foremost, primarily, is to glorify God. Secondarily, is to benefit the body of Christ, irregardless of how they respond to it. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Here's another reason why we shouldn't be weary for well in well-doing, because in due season, we're going to reap if we faint not. And we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but uh, in this uh, uh, epistle to the Colossian church, Paul's going to deal with this real good. And he's going to deal with it in the same way I'm introducing it now by way of motivation. Why do we do the things that we do? Now, Paul in Colossians, again, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but Paul in Colossians talks about men pleasers. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you, you know them. Uh, they're doing things, uh, whether it's on the job or in the body of Christ, they're doing things to please men as opposed to pleasing God. Because again, saints, man may not re respond to our loving kindness the way we would like for them to. But let me tell you this. When we show loving kindness, compassion, sympathy, empathy, understanding one toward another, the recipient of it may not respond the way we want to, but understand that we're going to reap. Huh? The Bible says, for in due season. Now, sometimes we don't like due season because due season is not necessarily all the time uh, right when we uh, complete the act of love. A due season uh, is a code term for God's sovereignty. In other words, he does it when he gets ready. And when he gets ready is when it's perfect. When he gets ready, it's the perfect time for us to reap. But understand, in due season, in God's timing, in God's providential work, you and I are going to reap if we don't give up. That's what the word faint means. Don't mean pass out. It means to give up. And we're giving up because we're tired of folk not treating us the way we're treating them. Don't be weary in well-doing. Understand that you're going to reap in due season if you don't faint. Notice what it says here in verse number 10, saints. Listen very carefully. And as therefore we have opportunity. Don't worry about the opportunity. God is going to give you opportunity. Every day you wake up, you're going to have an opportunity to show love, first of all, to your family, to your co-workers, to strangers. As we therefore have opportunity, here it is, saints, let us do good to what? To all men. All men. Now, all in the Greek means all. Yeah, it, it means everybody. Right? It, it, it means friend and it means foe. It means folk that are treating you the way you would like to be treated and folk that are treating you not the way you like to be treated. All means all. We do not discriminate in terms of the good that we do one for another. As therefore we have opportunity, this is the word of God, authoritative word of God, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, here it is, saints, especially though, <laughs> unto them who are in the household of faith. We ought to be looking for extra opportunities to bless one another. It should not be a chore. It should not be seen as a task for us to love those and to do good to those that are in the household of faith. And the word of God informs us that if Christ is inside of you and he is Lord of your life, these two verses are going to be evident consistently in your life. It's not going to be a sprinkling here or a sprinkling there. It's going to be something that is consistent in your life as we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Because, saints, this is a work of the Spirit. The Bible tells us that the fruit, remember now, fruit is evidence in the Bible. Particularly in the New Testament, anytime you see the word fruit, it talks about evidence. So the evidence, the fruit, the evidence of the Spirit, that is a Spirit-filled life, What's the first fruit? What's the first evidence? Love. And, 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 and all those other fruits, all those other evidences spring out from what? Agape love. They spring out from agape love. This is for us to look inside of ourselves and say, how am I doing on loving on folk? As God gives me opportunity Am I loving on folk, especially those folk at First Baptist Church Denby, especially my other brothers and sisters in Christ? And this is going to be evident, saints. Oh, goodness. This is going to be evident, saints, in the life of a true believer. Let's go back over to Colossians. We got work to do over in Colossians. Let's go to Colossians chapter number one. Oh, yes. Verse four says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. Notice what it says here in verse number five. 
for the hope, huh? Which is laid up for you in heaven. For the hope that's laid up for you in heaven. What is the hope of the believer? The ultimate hope of the believer is that by if either by way of physical death or by way of the rapture, our eternal hope is that we're going to be in heaven with God for all of eternity. And while we're in heaven, we're going to experience joy unspeakable, full of glory, where there's going to be no sickness, there's going to be no disease, there's going to be no death, there's not going to be, there's not going to be any trials and tribulations that we got to deal with. None of that is evident in heaven. This is our eternal hope. This is, this is the object, as it were, of our faith in terms of its ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a consequence of that, our hope is that when we die or we're raptured up, we're going to be in heaven for all of eternity. This is why Paul says, for the hope, definite article, the hope. It is the hope of every believer. Watch this now. Laid up is in store, huh? For you where in heaven. What did Jesus Christ say in the gospel according to John chapter number 14? I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> oh yeah. It's laid up for us in heaven. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to get things ready for you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there what? You may be also. Oh, he's coming back, saints. This is our hope. He's coming back to receive us. Glory to God unto himself. It is our hope that is laid up in store for us in heaven. Where God is now. And where one day you and I are going to be. Our hope is inextricably connected to what? Our faith. Inextricably connected to our faith. Our faith, right, leads to our hope, which is laid up for us, being prepared for us by none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven. This is what he says here, saints. Paul's building. He says, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of what? Of the gospel, of the gospel. You have faith in Jesus Christ. This, this produces in us the hope of glory, the hope that you are now going to be with God, with Jesus Christ in heaven for all of eternity. This is made possible by us hearing, huh, the word of truth, which Paul describes here as the gospel, euangelion in the Greek. Classical Greek, it simply means good news. And the good news is that wretched sinners that are undone, like Reverend Perkins, right, can be again delivered, can be saved, can be ransomed, right, from the penalty and power of my wretched, depraved sin, and that is in, in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel message. And it is good news. It's the best news that you can hear. When you understand your sinful condition vis-a-vis -vis God, who is holy, righteous, perfect in all his ways, when you look at your sinful condition vis-a-vis -vis him, and God engenders inside your heart a repentance, a sorrow, a contrite heart based on your sin. You see that? You hear now the good news that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God, it is eternal life, which is my hope. And that hope, saints, is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in and through him. It's in and through him. This is the gospel message. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is contained. Oh, I love this, saints. 
in the word of truth. <laughs> yeah, it's contained in the word of truth. And the word of truth, saints, is Genesis on over to the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel is found there. And you got to hear it. Huh? You got to hear it. That's why the apostle Paul says, I'm determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. When we teach the word of God, when we preach the word of God, we got to hold up the blood stained banner. We got to preach Christ and him crucified. Because that is, saints, the gospel message. This is, we have the message that saves folk from their sin, pulls them out of spiritual darkness into the marvelous light of God, quickens or makes them alive. Those that were once spiritually dead are now what made alive through regeneration. They're born again. We have the gospel message. Why are we hiding it? We ought to be shouting it from the mountaintop. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Go into all the world and preach this gospel, this good news, this saving message. The only you and I have in and through the word of God. Paul says, you, you done heard it before the word, in the word of, of truth, of the gospel. Here it is, which is come unto you. Huh? Through the preaching of the gospel. Here it is now, saints. It's not only come to you as it is in all of the world. Oh, yeah. This is the gospel message must be preached. It must be taught. It must be proliferated, spread. It must be, here it is, saints, live out in our everyday lives. We ought to be the ambassadors the representatives of what Christ can do in a life that is transformed by the power of the gospel message. This message has got to be spread. We have the message, saints. Oh, but Satan and the forces of evil are trying to do everything they can to silence this message. Oh, we, we, we come to church. You have some so-called pastor some so-called preacher, some so-called teacher. They talk about everything except Jesus and him crucified. Just go, ahead, just go ahead and have a seat. And let someone that God has called and understands the import of this gospel message that once saints is heard and, it, and God does a work in the heart, it transforms from the, in, from the inside out. It gives us hope of eternal and everlasting life. It compels us through the power of the spirit to show love to everybody. This is the gospel message. It's contained in the word of God. It not only, Paul says, came to you, but it is in all the world. And how can it get into all the world if we sit on it, saints? We've got to spread it. We've got to spread it. Not only with our mouths, but moreover, saints, we've got to spread it with what? Our lifestyle. This is very clear in scripture. The Bible says, let your light, metaphor for your life, shine, manifest, be made known unto men, anyone you come in contact with, that they may see your good works that are produced in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, that are produced because of the transformation of the gospel message. And then they give God glory. And the best way you can give glory to God is to receive his son as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be rescued. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be saved. You're going to be saved. It's come unto you as is written in all the world and bring it forth fruit. <laughs> yes, this is what the gospel does, saints. It brings forth fruit. What we say fruit was? Evidence. It's the evidence of a transformed life. The Bible says you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. Jesus Christ said, and, and, and staying on the, on the concept of love, Jesus Christ said, when you love one another, 
as I have loved you by this, by the love you and I share one for another, by this, men, the world, will know that you're what? My disciples. You're the ones that truly follow after me. The gospel message, when it comes, when it is preached, when it is lived, and it comes upon a life prepared by the Holy Ghost in the sovereign work of God, oh, it's going to produce fruit. It's going to produce evidence, transformation in a life. And saints, we have the privilege, and it is a privilege. You and I have the privilege of the message. You and I have the privilege to do what? To spread it. So we have to look in ourselves. We got to take a look at Perkin and say, am I spreading the gospel message the way it ought to be spread? Am I the sower that sows the seed of the word of God and let God give the increase? Our job is to sow the seed of the word of God through your mouth and also through what? Your life. You see that? Because when we do that, we have the distinct privilege and honor to be God's instruments by which this life-saving gospel message is spread. Oh, Paul's going to work, saints, and he's only in chapter one. He's going to work already. It's going, Paul says, to bring forth fruit. Paul said, as it is uh, done also in you, since the day you heard it, huh? And you knew, you understood what? The grace of God, where? In the truth. <laughs> oh, you, uh, you, we all can think back on our gospel experience, our salvation experience. It transformed us when we understood that we were the recipients of the unmerited favor of God. We do know that uh, uh, we didn't deserve to be saved. That's why it's called grace. If we deserve to be saved, we earned it. And you and I cannot earn it. We can't work hard enough. We cannot work long enough. And we cannot work good enough in order to earn our place in heaven. In order to earn right standings with God impossible so in order for us to be in right standings with god in order for us to get our ticket to heaven we've got to be recipients of the grace of god are you getting it tonight saints you and i if your name is written in the land book of life you are a recipient of say of the saving grace of god the saving grace of god oh this is a shouting sermon already He's already, he's only in chapter one, saints, but he's already given out the gospel. He meant it when he said, I'm determined of nothing among you but Christ and crucified. He has given the impacts of the euangelion, the good news that Jesus has come into this world. He says a true and faithful saying that Jesus humbled himself, came down into this world to save sinners. And Paul says, hey, I am the chief one. I'm the chief one. Oh, it brings forth fruit as it did also in you since the day you heard of it and you knew of the grace of God in truth. Notice what it says here in verse number seven. Verse number seven, we're, we're introduced to Amaphis. This is either the pastor and or founder of the Colossian church. At the very least, he's the pastor of the church. And Paul gives him a great, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul gives him a great commendation. Notice what he says here. You learned of, of Amaphorias, our dear fellow servant. Now, Paul gives several um, commendations to this dear brother. He calls him, first of all, he calls him a dear fellow servant. Okay. Now, what he means by a fellow servant is that he is in the same business that Paul is in. And you know what? You and I should be in that same business. And that is 
the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Barabbas is a pastor. So he's a fellow servant of Paul. He's in the same enterprise of Paul with Paul that is preaching the gospel message and also preaching the truth of the word of God, the foundational doctrines that are contained in the word of God. Because God didn't save us to sit down, nor did he save us to just, to just talk about and, and stay on our salvation experience. We've now got to grow both in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've got to feast upon the word of God. And this faithful, what Paul says, dear fellow servant, here it is now, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. He is a faithful servant of Christ, bond servant. The word minister is a nice, uh, uh, fluffy translation. The word is bond servant, slave. You see that? He is a faithful slave of Christ. And he is faithful in the execution of what he's doing in the church at Colossians. And the first thing he's doing is he's preaching the gospel message. And then he's also preaching again the foundational truths. See, the pastor here, uh, he's got to preach the gospel. And then he's got to preach the truth of the word of God Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, revival after revival. Every time he stands before God's people, he's got to preach the gospel and he got to preach the, the tenets of the faith on a consistent basis. This is why Paul calls him a fellow servant and he calls him faithful. This is what he has got to do. We've got to go to this because this is important. I want us to go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. Yes, 1 Peter chapter number 5. We've got to go through this. Paul says here that Hermaphras is a faithful co-laborer, right? Bond servant of Jesus Christ. One that has preached the gospel and the tenets, the doctrine, the teachings, the body of teaching, the positive truth that Paul calls it, of the word of God. This is his responsibility. And he's to be faithful in it. We already talked about faithful. He's, he's to be, he's to have a great deal of fidelity in doing that. He does it week after week. This is his number one responsibility within the body of Christ. Number one responsibility in the body of Christ as a pastor is to give us a steady diet of the word of God. The number one priority, that mean, that mean he, don't have, he have other priorities, but the number one priority is to feed us the truth of the word of God Sunday after Sunday. And to do that, you got to study it. That's why he says, study to show us approve unto God a workman, could take work to study the word of God, a workman need not be ashamed because you're rightly dividing the word of truth. Right dividing the word means that you are exact. You're precise. You're concise. That takes work. And anything that uh, that someone does that's less than that, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that is shameful before God. Number one priority. Now, listen what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter number 5. Begin at verse number 1. He says the elders, the word is presbytery. It could be elder, pastor, bishop. The word is presbytery in the Greek. The presbytery, which are among you, Peter says, I am exhorting you, who am also an elder. Here it is. And I'm an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Here's what you do. You feed the flock of God that is among you. The sphere of influence that God gives you, you feed the flock, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingness, not for filthy lucre, not for, and the, for, the phrase filthy lucre is dishonest gain, but of a what? A disciplined mind. That's studying it. You got to have a disciplined mind. To give folk the truth of the word of God. The Bible is very, very clear. You are to feed the flock of God. When you leave Bible study, when you leave 
church service, you ought to be filled up with the word of God. You ought to be filled with the word of God. Very, very important, saints. And this fellow, what Paul says, dear fellow servant, minister of Jesus Christ, he is doing this faithfully. Let's go back to Colossians. I had to go to this because this is very, very important. We need to know what to look for. You need to, we need to have someone that's going to feed us the word of God Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, whatever event it is, he is coming with the word of God to feed us. This is the number one responsibility of any pastor. Let's go back to Colossians. Chapter number one, and we're going to wrap up our time together. Notice what it says here, saints. Very clear in the text. Notice what it says here, saints. B clause of seven. Who is for you a faithful minister of Christ? Here it is. Who also declare unto us your love in the spirit. So, this fellow servant, minister of the gospel, he's preaching, he's teaching the truth of the word of God to these church, to these uh, uh, members of this Colossian church. And now what he's doing is <laughs> he goes back to the apostle Paul and begins to do a little bit of bragging on him. Because he, report, <laughs> he reports back to the apostle Paul the love. Huh? The agape love that, the, that he is seeing within the church and implied outside of the church. They are demonstrating the agape love of Christ. And Paul says, make no mistake about it, saints. It is in the spirit. It is empowered by the spirit that you and I show love one to another and also to the world at large. It's in and through the power of the Spirit. It's evidence that you and I are living a Spirit-filled life. Well, saints, our time is up. we not sure we're going to be able to get through all this, but we did, and we thank God for it. We thank God for it. We trust, as always, uh, that this has been, uh, these lessons have been a benediction and a blessing uh, to each and every one of you. And I, again, want to thank uh, Diggin Roy Carswell and the technology ministry uh, for standing in the gap as I was out for a couple of weeks. Uh, you guys were in great hands with Roy. But we thank God. Uh, we are delighted uh, to be back uh, teaching Wednesday night Bible study here at First Baptist Church, Denby. We love each and every one of you with the love of the Lord. And as always, we don't want to end our time together uh, without um, giving and sharing the gospel. message. We talked a lot about the gospel today. The gospel message is the power under salvation. And today, saints, is a day of salvation, not tomorrow, not even later on tonight, because neither is promised to us. We need if you're on this uh, uh, Facebook live uh, post tonight and you don't have Christ in your life, you need to give Christ your life tonight. Today, right now is the day of salvation. We said it in our lesson today. We're sinners. We were born that way. It's called the depravity of man. We were born in this state. And there's nothing we, you and I could do in our own power to free ourselves from the penalty of our sin. But Jesus Christ, he paid it all. He died on the cross for your sin and for mine. In other words, he took your place and my place on the cross because the wages of sin is death, separation from God for all of eternity. When we place saving faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are delivered from the penalty and power of our sin. This is the euangelion. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I present to you tonight, Jesus Christ. Reverend Perkins, I already have, I'm already saved, but you're looking for a church home. You need to have a church home where you can work out your soul salvation, fear and trim a church that believes in the word of God and that teaches and preaches the word of God consistently. This is the type of church that you need to find yourself in. And I present to you First Baptist Church, Denby. This church is going to love on you. It's going to love on your family as well. And we have spiritual resources your family needs for you to walk, live in divine purpose and destiny. 
for you to mature and grow in the faith. I present to you First Baptist Church, Denby. Well, saints, again, what a privilege and the honor it is for me to teach and to preach this word. This word is something else. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful. There's nothing like it. It is power. It's exactly what it says about itself. It's powerful. Uh, it's able to convert uh, our souls, and, and we thank God for it. And again, we trust that it's been a benediction and a blessing to each and every one of you. So now, saints, let us close out our time together uh, in Bible study. Father, we thank you for this wonderful uh, lesson that you have given to us straight from your word. And we are praying, Father God, first of all, we want to thank you for the gospel message. It is good news. We thank you, Father God, that based on your perfect will, based on your sovereignty, your providential work, that we heard the gospel message. And in that hearing of the gospel message, you engender inside of us saving faith. And we place that saving faith on the person and the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you're working, Father God, in and through us to love one another just as Christ has loved us. And we're praying, Father God, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. What foolishness to be ashamed of the message that saves souls, snatches them from hell's fire. We have, God, that message. We're praying, Father God, for as Paul says in this letter, give us boldness of speech. God, that we may proliferate this good news, this life-changing gospel. And help us, Father God, to live out this gospel in our everyday lives. God, we thank you on the night for this word. We pray, Father God, for the power of the Holy Spirit, that he may apply it to our everyday lives, to our thinking, that it be transformed by the renewing, Father God, of our minds. We love you on the day, Father, because you first loved us. Continue to bless this church. Continue, Father God, to bless the families that this church represents. That we move, Father God, continuously move toward Christ-likeness. That you may be honored and glorified in our everyday lives. We thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, saints, God bless each and every one of you. Again, we thank God for your presence here tonight. We certainly want to thank God, uh, 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 Brother Kelly, <laughs> God bless you, sir. Uh, uh, Minister Fox, God bless you. Give Tony my love. TJ, God bless you, sir. Uh, tells Chris Ann, we love her. Dr. Tab, God bless you as well. Sister Austin, God bless you. We see a Dontia. Deaconess Taylor, God bless you and Deacon Taylor. Sister Scott, God bless each and every one of you. Sister Brown, God bless you as well. Sister Lillian, God bless you. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in as well. Well, saints, we love you with the love of the Lord. We can be with you all night long. We pray and trust that you'll be with us, God willing, next Wednesday. But before that, uh, we're praying that whether you're in the sanctuary or by way of Facebook, we pray that you would tune in to our worship service this Sunday. Uh, we'll hear another message from the Reverend Dr. Earl C. Johnson. We thank God for him uh, and his ministry. Saints, we love you with the love of the Lord. Pray that you have a wonderful night and we'll see you right here next time. God bless each and every one of you.